I pray once again that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I suspect at some point in your life, either you've heard someone say that or you may have said it yourself. The thing about that playground mantra is that it assumes that physical pain is worse than emotional pain. And I'm going to tell you something that you already know. That's not true. Physical pain can be difficult, and it's a struggle. But it's that emotional pain that gets down deep in us, eats away at us, works in us. I had a new young man who was a a phenomenal football player in high school. He was... uh, He was... So good that he was recruited by big football programs, including the University of Wisconsin. He eventually went to University of Wisconsin on a full scholarship and was involved there, was getting into the program as a freshman and practicing and getting all that, doing all those things. And then in the middle of that, he quit. And he said the reason he quit wasn't because the physical demands were so great. He quit because the emotional demands were so great. Because the things that went on off the field, the things that went on with coaches and teammates, the, the, the struggle that he go, had to go through, the mental games, all of those things, he just couldn't do it. It wasn't the physical part of it that got to him. It was the emotional part. And we all understand that in one way or another. At the heart of our struggle as human beings is this yearning to be loved. We were created for love. We were created to be loved. But because of sin, because of brokenness, because of all the ways in which the world has become what it is, now we grow up yearning to be loved, and it's at the heart of our human struggle. And I find it fascinating that we aren't barely halfway through the very first book of the Bible, and we encounter this very real human struggle of the yearning to be loved. And I'm convinced that that struggle has a bearing on everything else about our lives. And I'd like to look at this story that we just read. There are many people we could look at in the story, many ways we could look at it. I want to look at it from Leah's perspective. When you look at it from Leah's perspective, this is a this is a heart wrenching story. I can't imagine the shame and humiliation that Leah lives with. She is she is living in this family of quite frankly high levels of dysfunction. I mean. I keep thinking to myself, God, you couldn't find a better family than this? This is what we get? I mean, this is the very definition of dysfunction. Everything about it is dysfunctional. It, there's generations of dysfunction. There's a great par- part of this in, in chapter 29 when, before we got to this, when uh, Jacob arrives there and Laban meets him. He, and he says, Jacob tells Laban all his story. And if you don't know Jacob's story, it's a story of 
deceiving his father into getting the blessing, it cheating his older brother out of the blessing that he deserves, and then running away. And he tells him this whole story. What does Laban say? You really are our flesh and blood, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, you, you get it. You get us. You're definitely one of us. There is this dysfunction in families, and the reality is all of our relationships are broken. All of them have brokenness in them. All of, our, all of our relationships have levels of dysfunction. Now, granted, there are higher and lower levels of brokenness and dysfunction. And we see that all around us. We see the high levels of dysfunction. And hopefully, we've experienced lower levels of brokenness. But the reason I know that's true is because there are no perfect people. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And not only do we experience brokenness, we can contribute to the brokenness as well. But we've all experienced the brokenness of wishing, hoping, yearning for people to treat us different than they do. We, we are yearning to be loved. And the problem with all this brokenness and dysfunction in our relationships, we're talking about families, friends, acquaintances, whatever, all of that always ends up leading to dysfunction and hurt and pain. We, the problem with brokenness, too, is that it leads us to, not, to hurt people often by using them. I mean, you look at the story, and Leah is a pawn in the story. I don't know how much say she has in her father's plan. But knowing what I do know about that culture, more than likely, there's not a lot she can do. At least if she wants to ever have a husband. If she ever wants to, to be, experience things that she wants to experience. In that culture, women had very few rights. And Laban uses her to get what he wants, more out of Jacob. His deceptiveness. And she is just a pawn trapped in, in this story and, and in his schemes. And what strikes me as I think about that is that there are more people in the world than we probably realize who live in that kind of vulnerability. People who live in the vulnerability of, of the schemes of other people. People who are pawns in other people's greed, other people's power, all the things that people want, which people are just there to be used. And we see that on the grander scale of the world. Sometimes we're blind to it in our personal relationships. The ways in which we manipulate people and use people and the ways that we feel manipulated and used. And all the while we're crying out, I just want to be loved. I just want to be loved. And instead of being loved, we feel shame and humiliated. Again, I'm, I'm thinking about Leah's feelings in this story. I can't imagine. The humiliation and shame of realizing that her father believes that the only way she could ever get a husband is if he tricks someone into marrying her. And then to think about the conversation that took place the morning after the wedding as Jacob is yelling at Laban that why have you saddled me with her? shame and the humiliation. And I suspect that in one way or another, we know that shame and that humiliation, the rejection, being ignored, being left out, being unwanted. The scripture talks about Leah's eyes. It says that the, the NIV translation says Leah's eyes didn't sparkle. So I find it inter it's an interesting way of translating that. A lot of the translations say her eyes are weak. 
the truth of the matter is the word that's used there means delicate. It actually is a, it's actually a positive word. It means nice. You could almost say she has attractive eyes. But they're, they're put in comparison to Rachel. And she doesn't fare well with that. You know, thinking about Leah's eyes, it's sort of like that conversation when someone wants to fix you up on a blind date and you say, well, what does he look like? Well, he's got great table manners. <laughs> you know, it, it, it sort of feels like that. And the problem is we all have gifts and we all have wonderful things about us that often people don't see. Because our culture, in all of its brokenness, tends to see these things and ignore these things. And all of our giftedness, all of, our, all of the ways in which we can contribute, all the ways in which we could be loved are ignored. Because people don't value those things. And the hurt just keeps getting deeper. And the scars keep getting worse. And the pain we feel as we hear, like Leah, the writer saying, Jacob loved Rachel far more than Leah. You can hear Leah crying out, I just want to be loved like Rachel. You know what's interesting? Rachel's struggling too. The first verse of chapter 30 says, Rachel comes to Jacob. You know, it said Rachel couldn't have children. Rachel comes to Jacob and says, give me children or I'll die. Give me children or my life means nothing. And you know, we always think that people who have so much, they've arrived. They've got it. We wish we had what they had. They must be happy. They must be joyful. They must have figured it out. They must feel loved. Maybe not. There is a reason why, no matter what we have, we always want a little more of whatever it is. The agony, the burden, the heartache. And you know, you would think, you would think that Leah would be the most sensitive person in the world to other people going through pain. You would think that Leah would know what it feels like to be used and manipulated. And she would be the first person to step up and say, we're not doing that. And yet we find as the story goes along that when she stops having children, Rachel gives her handmaid to Jacob to have children for her, and when she has a couple of children, Leah says, I've got to do something too. And she takes this maid and says, I'm going to use you for my purposes. I'm going to use you to maybe as a way for my husband to love me. Because you see, undealt with pain doesn't necessarily make us more sensitive to pain, but it does cause us often to cause pain. Because we act out of our brokenness. We act out of our yearning. We act out of our hurt and our pain. Which is why these things tend to be get passed along from person to person to person. And somewhere in this story, somewhere in our stories... We're asking ourselves, but what do we do? How does it get different? How do we change? Every time Leah has a child, at least the first three children, she says, maybe now my husband will love me. Wow. There is a lot in that statement. 
She has a child, and she says, now maybe my husband will love me. She has a second child. Now maybe my husband will love me. She has a third child. Now maybe my husband will love me. After she has six children, she says, I've had six children now. Now surely my husband will love me. And what she doesn't realize, what she's missing, is that she thinks the children are going to make her lovable. But actually, what I think God is saying to her is, Leah, I love you. That's why I'm blessing you with children. That's why I'm giving you your heart's desire. That's why I'm doing this for you, because I love you. And the problem that you and I have, the problem human beings have always had, is that we think we have to do something for God to love us. We think we have to accomplish something. And if we do, then maybe we'll experience real deep love. Because real deep love can only ultimately come from God. We need to love each other. And how we love each other is vitally important. But that ultimate yearning for which we were created to be loved can only be found in God. And the struggle we have is that somewhere in our brokenness, we believe if we just do this, then we'll be loved. If we just accomplish that, then we'll be loved. If, we just, if I was just a better person, then I would be, God would love me. If I just did more things for God, then God would love me. But God keeps telling us, no, I love you, period. I just love you. As one writer says, There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's also nothing we can do to make God love us less. And I think we wrestle with both of those ideas. I've shared this with you before, but Craig Barnes says that in the first couple of months of seminary, he was sitting in a class and a professor said to his class, you ought to wake up every morning and give thanks to God that you are unnecessary and they all looked at him and said what and they began to push back he said we all recognize that we're none of us are indispensable we can all be replaced we get that but surely we're necessary what kind of a life is it if we're not necessary and the professor said to them oh no you're too important too valuable to be necessary You deserve to be loved. Because if you're loved and valuable only because you're necessary, what happens when you're no longer necessary? If you're only valuable and loved, if you can accomplish things, what happens when you can't accomplish them anymore? God doesn't look at us and say, I love you, Because you do things for me. I love you because you're good. I love you because you're necessary. He looks at us and says, I simply love you. Period. And I love the fact that in this story, God's love is tangible. God's blessings are tangible. Sometimes we think about the love of God as just sort of mystical and ethereal. It's just something we kind of feel. But in this story, God's love is tangible. And the reality is, page after page after page of Scripture keeps reminding us that God's love is tangible. Until we get to the third chapter of John, when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. That's why we come to this table today. We come to this table, this table that brings us face to face with the reality of God's love for us. That he would send his son, become one of us, die for us. This is our God. And he comes for you and you and you and you and you. 
all of us. This is our God. It's difficult for us because the evil one keeps whispering in our ears, that's not true. That's not true. Why would God love you? Why would God care about you? You know, Leah goes through this. After the fourth child is born, she says, now I'm just going to praise God. And you think, okay, she's figured it out. She's gotten there. She's made it. And then after children's, children five and six, she's back to, maybe this will make my husband love me. It's a journey for us. That's why we need to be reminded so often. That's why God keeps coming to us in, in a myriad of ways, ultimately that culminates in Jesus. You are my beloved sons and daughters, period. I love you. I always find it interesting that if you, you know, most of the time we don't read the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. If you're reading through the Bible, you're sort of like, well, I got an off day today because I'm not reading through all those names. But there is something intriguing about that genealogy. Because if you look, if you follow it backwards, generation to generation to generation, eventually you get back to Judah. And the scripture tells us again and again about Jesus being in the line of Judah. And I love the fact that Judah is Leah's son. There is something profound about that. You remember on the playground, grade school, and choosing up teams to play softball or soccer or whatever it is that you play. And, you know, all, everybody's there at recess and you're, you're getting the game organized. And you know that, that horrible time when everybody lines up and you got two team captains and they're picking people. And you hate that time because you're not just not the best player. Everybody knows you're the worst player. If you're playing softball, every ball hit to you goes through your legs. If it doesn't go over your head, it hits you on the head. When you come up to bat, everybody yells, move in, move in, which they really don't need to do because you've never once put the bat on the ball. You know that feeling, and you're standing there in this line, and as the line is evaporating into teams, you're still standing there. You know that feeling? The humiliation. Well, what if one day, you're out, they're lining up, and your best friend is the best athlete out there. It doesn't matter what sport you're playing. If it's baseball, he hits home runs every time. If it's soccer, he scores every goal. If it's football, he's throwing the winning touchdowns. Whatever it is, the best athlete. And he gets first pick, because the team captains are always the best, right? And he looks around at everybody lined up there, he knows how good and how bad everybody is. And he looks around at everyone, and then he turns back to you, and he says, I'll take him. I'll take her. And you walk over, and you stand next to him, stand next to her, and you can just feel the confidence rising in you because you've been chosen not because you're the best but because he's your friend and I want to tell you in infinitely bigger ways God is looking at every one of you and looking at me and saying, I want you. I love you. Period. If that could get into our heads deeper and deeper, the truth of that 
it'll change our lives. And it will change the lives of others. Because they will see something in us that will draw them not just to us, but to the one who loves them too. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us.